for organizing that. Well, moving to our, our panel, uh, I think we have the privilege, as uh, Minister Gilmar Mendes said, of having with us uh, uh, Mr. Tom Friedman. Uh, Tom, as uh, uh, all of you know, is a colonist of uh, New York Times, um, and uh, he likes to be called journalist. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I, I don't like, I, of course, uh, we do respect his amazing journalist career, uh, but Tony is, is, uh, is much more of a philosopher, uh, one of the most sophisticated uh, thinkers of uh, our time. Tom wrote uh, The World is Flat uh, 20 years ago, uh, uh, became not only a bestseller, winner of uh, innumerable awards, but uh, more important than that, I think was the first time that globalization was uh, 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 well described and describe it in on the ground worlds of uh, someone with uh, uh, the foot on the mood in terms of uh, seeing the world. Um, we'll talk about that, but Don, to kick off our, our conversation, I know that uh, you are working on a new book and uh, a book that reflects what we are living uh, at this stage. So maybe we should start talking, what is about your book, your new book? Andre, first of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, Minister Jumar, thank you so much for inviting me. It's great to be back in Lisbon. I was here 40 years ago, uh, traveling with Secretary of State Baker. I was here for 24 hours, and um, it's great to be back for 72. So thank you very much. Uh, the place has uh, developed so much, so beautifully since I've been here. Can you move that away? It's distracting me. Thanks. So I am working on a new book. Um, uh, it's a book on... Uh, how to write a column, uh, because we live in an age where everyone wants to be a columnist, uh, whether on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. And so I thought I'd write about something that I knew about. Um, uh, you you have is, much more competition these yeah, days, right? exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so the first half of the book is, is literally uh, 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 how, why I write, um, uh, uh, how I write a column, uh, and... Um, how I actually uh, learn, uh, because we all learn differently. And so let me begin by just sharing with you the chapter on how I learn, um, which sets up the second half of the book, which is what I saw during my, I've been a journalist now since 1978. So the way I learn is by going to the edge, going to the edge of three different realms, because it's at the edge where all the best learning happens. When you're at the edge, you get to see things in stark relief, and at the edge, you get to name things, because you're at the edge first. Feels like the world's a little flat out here. So I learned by going to the edge of three different realms. Uh, the first edge I went to was the edge of human behavior. I lived in a civil war in Beirut, for five years, 1979 to 1984. And I got to see how human molecules behave at very high temperatures, uh, both for incredible evil and incredible kindness under extreme pressure. And it widened my whole perspective, basically, about human behavior, uh, much wider than I learned growing up in Minnesota uh, in the 1950s and 60s. Um, this, what I also learned in Beirut, though, was to be an anthropologist. Because in Beirut, when I was there, there was no data. Because there was no government, really. So the only data was talking to another human being. So I developed a very anthropological approach to journalism. When I wanted to know what the trend was, I went out and interviewed 20, 30 people. I confessed in Beirut to Jerusalem, my first book, that because I lived in a city with no data and one of my jobs as a young reporter was to file the daily weather report from Beirut, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I made up the weather report every day. Um, uh, it basically went like this. Ahmed, how did it feel out there today? Oh, Mr. Tom, kind of hot. Like 82, would you say? Yeah, 82. Hi, Beirut 82. 
Last night, Ahmed, how did it feel? Oh, kind of cool, Mr. Tom. Say 75, yeah, yeah, that's good. Low Beirut 75. And thus was the weather report filed in a city with no data. The second edge I went to was the edge of technology. I am technically the foreign affairs columnist for the New York Times. But I developed a habit of coming to companies, big companies, like Walmart or General Electric or Microsoft, and uh, meeting with their CEOs, like Andre, and just asking them two questions, basically. I would tell them, I'm not interested in your quarterly profits. I'm not interested in your stock price. I'm not interested in your revenues, and I'm not even interested in your successor. I'm just interested in two things. I want to spend time in your research lab. I want to know what's going on at the tippy tip tip of your spear. Because if you want to understand the future, hang out with people who are inventing it. And I want to spend time in your human resources department. I want to understand how you are training your people for the future you're inventing. Because my intuition is that's coming to a neighborhood near me. That approach brought me to Bangalore, India in 2004 to a company called Infosys, um, uh, which at the time was the leading company in the world doing outsourcing. And after two weeks of seeing all the outsourcing going on in Bangalore. I sat down with Infosys CEO Nanda Nilakani outside his office. We were actually doing it on film. And I had my laptop in my lap. And at one point, Nanda said to me, Tom, the global economic playing field is being leveled. And you Americans are not ready. Oh, I wrote that down in my laptop. The global economic playing field is being leveled, and you Americans are not ready. Well, after we got done, I got back in my Jeep, and I went from an electronic city where Infosys is located back to Bangalore. And all the way in the ride, I kept rolling over in my head what Nandan had said. The global economic playing field is being leveled, and you Americans are not ready. And after a while, it struck me that what he was really saying was the global economic playing field is being flattened. And then it just popped into my head that India's premier engineer entrepreneur just told me the world is flat. And I wrote that down in my notebook, the world is flat. I got back to my hotel, the Leela Palace in Bangalore. I ran up to my room. I called my wife in Washington, DC and said, honey, I'm going to write a book called The World is Flat. <laughs> She now says she thought that was a brilliant idea. It's not exactly how I remember the conversation, but the point is I came to that insight because I was hanging out at the edge of the story with an engineer entrepreneur who could explain it to me. When people ask me what I do for a living, I tell them I am a translator from English to English. I take really complicated subjects, break them down so I can understand them, and then I translate them for other people. The third edge I went to was the edge of environment, which is how Andre and I actually met. My wife was on the board of Conservation International with Andre, and for 16 years I visited every pristine ecosystem on the planet with Conservation International from Brazil and the Amazon, the Atlantic rainforest, um, uh, all across the planet. I went with the U.S. Navy on a submarine under the Arctic, had some amazing experiences. I did it first to learn about nature because I didn't know very much about nature. But then I did it to learn from nature because I came to see a pattern. And the pattern was which ecosystem survived when the climate changed. And it was all the ecosystems that built complex adaptive networks where all the elements of the ecosystem network together with healthy interdependencies to maximize their adaptability, productivity, and resilience. Now, nature did that emergently. The deer ate the grass, the lion ate the deer. Okay, did it emergently and violently. 
but I came to understand and appreciate the role of complex adaptive networks. So hold that thought just for a second. Now my, my innovation from a journalistic point of view was to meld all three of those perspectives together. So when I come to Lisbon, I'm looking at you in 3D. I'm asking what's going on in human society, what's going on in business, and what's going on in the environment. And I bring that 3D lens everywhere I go. That's how I learn. Now, I actually got my graduate degree in Arabic from Oxford in 1978. If we could go back in history and take that 1978 version of me, I was 25 years old then, bring him here and ask the 1978 version of me, hey, Tom, what's happened in Syria? The 1978 version of me would would give you a very historical, one-dimensional answer. Well, they had a coup attempt. It was like when Adib Shishakli overthrew Muhammad Jones in 1955. Whatever. I'd give you a very one-dimensional, historical answer. If you ask this version of me what's happened in Syria, this version of me will tell you Syria had the worst drought in its modern history between 2006 and 2011. A million Syrian farmers and herders left their home, flocked to the cities, overwhelmed the infrastructure. President Assad did nothing for them. Then they got on these babies and watched the revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt, and then they blew the lid off the whole country. It was the market, mother nature, and technology all coming together. And if you don't see it in 3D, you will not understand what happened. So that's how I learned. That's the perspective, basically, that I bring to my, my lens on the world. Now, what's the biggest thing I've learned? What's the biggest thing that's happened since I became a journalist in 1978? Well, I started thinking about this about 10 years ago just by reading the newspapers. And I noticed a pattern. I noticed that all the, all the political parties that had emerged with the Industrial Revolution about 75 years ago were all blowing up at the same time. The Tory Conservative Party in England became a Brexit party. This was an international business party, became a Brexit party. The Labour Party there became Marxist. The Liberals disappeared. Their, their former leader is, is now the spokesman for Facebook. How weird is that? Um, Republicans became a Trump cult. Democrats are always blowing up. And I have no idea who governs Italy today, but I don't think they're called Christian Democrats anymore. So something very big is happening. All these traditional parties of the last 75 years blew up at the same time. What is going on? What is going on, I argue, is that we are entering a new Promethean moment. So Prometheus was the Greek mythical god who stole fire from a closet on Mount Olympus and gave it to humans to build civilization. And we know what these Promethean moments are. They're the printing press, the scientific revolution, the agriculture revolution, the Industrial Revolution, and, uh, uh, this moment. Yeah, you, I, us, we are all here for something really, really big. We're here for a Promethean moment. And the definition of a Promethean moment is the introduction of a new technology or set of ideas that forces you not just to change one thing, forces you to change everything. How you govern, how you teach, how you learn, how you do business, how you commit crimes, how you fight crimes, how you fight war, how you run a university, how you run a law firm. We are in the middle of a Promethean moment. 
You know, I will remind you that when Gutenberg invented the printing press, someone was alive. And some monk said to some priest, now that's really cool. You mean I don't have to write this Bible out by hand anymore? We could just stamp them out? Well, you are here, I am here, we are here, for a similar Promethean moment. Now, the last Promethean moment was triggered by the combustion engine and the steam engine, the Industrial Revolution. And it took us about 100 years. We tried Marxism, we tried Nazism, we tried fascism, we tried all kinds of ways to govern this thing. And eventually, we settled on something called the welfare state. The welfare state seemed like the best model to get the best and cushion the worst of the Industrial Revolution. It had a Chinese version, a Russian version, an East European version, a Brazilian version, a West European version, an American version we called the New Deal. Now the welfare state was a set of walls, ceilings, and floors that would allow people to get the best and cushion the worst of the Industrial Revolution. And politics during this industrial age, in industrial democracies, was a debate between left and right, left and right, left and right, between how high the walls should be, walls of protection, left said high walls, right said low walls. How thick the floor, the safety net should be, left said thick floor, right said thin floor. And how tight the ceiling should be. The ceiling was on incomes and the pace of change. Left said low ceiling, right said no ceiling. 75 years, same debate, left, right, grid, binary, left, right, left, right, left, right. And then one day, kaboom. An energy source is released that blows off the ceiling, blows down the walls, and crashes through the floor and gives us a whole new set of problems that cannot be solved left, right. They can only be solved the way nature responds to climate change only with complex adaptive coalitions now, not networks. What nature does emergently, we have to do intentionally by building whole new coalitions to govern these whole new problems. Now, um, I give you a small example of that. I was in Israel in 2019 for the pandemic, and I ran into Amnon Shashua, the founder of Mobileye, which is the Israeli autonomous driving company that Intel bought for $14 billion, because Intel decided it wanted to be a car company. And Amnon said to me, Tom, have you ever driven in a self-driving car? I said, Amnon, I was just at Google. I drove in Waymo all over Mountain View, California, in a self-driving car. He said, Mountain View, that's a grid. Try driving in a self-driving car in Jerusalem where there are no two parallel streets. So I went up to Jerusalem, I rode in their car, up, down, around, donkeys, camels, Jews, Arabs, nobody's driving. Blew me away. Afterwards, he told me a story. To test a self-driving car in Jerusalem, you need an insurance protocol that determines what is safe self-driving. Otherwise, anyone you hit or anyone hit you, you would be sued. Well, it turns out the rabbis who run Jerusalem don't know a lot about self-driving cars. So Amnon had to convene a complex adaptive coalition of Volkswagen, his car supplier, Mobileye engineers, the rabbis who run Jerusalem, and the Israeli Ministry of Transportation, and they collaboratively wrote the law as a complex adaptive coalition. It's so good that Yandex, Russia's Google, started testing their self-driving cars in Israel, and China just took the whole Israeli law, translated into Chinese, and made it their law. Who is left and who is right in that story? There's no left and there's no right. There's just a totally new problem that the traditional left-right binary parties are not fit 
for purpose. They aren't fit for purpose. And what do parties do that aren't fit for purpose? They fall back on identity, culture, and tribalism. So what, is, what we're in the middle of is the emergence of a new Promethean moment. Now what is, and that is the energy source that blew up the wall, ceilings, and floors of the Industrial Revolution. What is unique about our Promethean moment from all the others is it's not built on a single technology like a printing press or a combustion engine. It's not built on a single set of new ideas like the Copernican Revolution, the scientific revolution. It's built on two super cycles. We're in the middle of two super cycles. One is a super cycle, and that is our ability to sense, sense things, then digitize those sensations, then connect those sensations to a processor, then process those sensations into insights, increasingly amplified by artificial intelligence, then learn from them, share them, act on them, and secure them. We're in the middle of a super cycle of sensing, digitizing, connecting, process learning, sharing, acting, and securing. And it's going into literally everything. I brought a prop this morning to illustrate this. This is a portable EKG machine, okay? This little card connects up with my iPhone, okay? I have arterial fibrillation sometimes. When I feel it coming, I put two fingers on here. It does an EKG on my cell phone. It senses my heartbeat. It digitizes it. It connects it to my iPhone. It processes it. It learns from it. It shares it with my cardiologist, who then acts on it by calling me and telling me to relax, OK? <laughs> that process, in miniature, is going into everything from your toaster to your refrigerator to your car to your F-35 fighter jet. And it has positive feedbacks. That is, the better the software gets, the better the hardware gets. The better the hardware gets, the better the software gets. The better the software gets, the better the hardware gets. And it goes around and it grows at a nonlinear rate. It grows exponentially. With the combustion engine, it grew linearly, 20 horsepower, 30 horsepower, 40 horsepower. No, no, not this. This grows 525, 175. It grows at a nonlinear rate. It is a super cycle. What is unique, though, about our Promethean moment is that it's paralleled by a climate super cycle. We've never had the two together at the same time. Emissions, warming, ice melt, change in ocean currents, change in wind patterns, extreme weather. It also operates on feedback loops, only they go the other way, basically. The more the ice melts, the less it reflects the sun, the more the ocean warms, the more climate change we get. So we're in the middle of two super cycles. That's our Promethean moment. And the convergence of the two of them blew off the ceiling, blew down the walls, and crashed through the floor. And suddenly, our old binary left-right politics wasn't fit for purpose. Because now we have a whole new set of problems that people have to govern, governments have to govern. How do we govern a world that's really fast? OK, that's about the pace of change. In the old world, you, know, you, could, be, you could have a leader, you could have a bad leader for five years. Eh, he got you five miles off course. In a fast world today, when you have a bad leader for five years, gets you 500 miles off course. And the pain of getting back on course can be devastating. By the way, whether it's your town, your company, or your country, OK? The world got fast. The world got fused. We're not just interconnected now. We are fused. Interdependence is now our condition. Friends, we are either going to rise together or we're going to fall together. But baby, whatever we're going to do, we're doing it together, OK? <laughs> the world got fast fused. It got deep, deep. You know, there's no global lexicographer. But you may have noticed, suddenly, we add the adjective deep to everything. 
deep state, deep mind, deep research, deep medicine, deep fake. Nothing could be just it. It has to be deep now. That's because technology is going so deep, we don't even know where it is anymore. So the old binary system, I, business, innovate, Andre innovates, I, government, regulate, completely breaks down because the government has no idea anymore where the innovator is. So in my book, I have these emails from Boeing during their crisis over the MAX jet. And we have leaked emails where a Boeing engineer is talking about his FAA regulator. And he says, my FAA regulator is so clueless about what I do, watching him watching me is like watching dogs watching television, okay? Okay? So the old binary, I government regulate, you go, doesn't work in a deep world. This actually has seeped into the popular culture. Some of you may have seen the, the, the movie um, uh, A Star is Born with Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga. The, listen to the lyrics of the main song. I'm off the deep end, watch as I dive in, I'll never reach the shore, crash through the surface. Where they can't hurt us, we're far from the shallow now. Oh, Andre, baby, we are far from the shallow now, okay? Everything is going deep. The world's getting fast, fused, deep, dual. Everything's dual use now. In the Cold War, that was an F-15. This is a commercial jet. One was, there was, the problem of dual use was very clear. Very few things were dual use. Now, anything that is connected and digital is dual use. My toaster is connected and digital and made in China. Does that mean China knows I like my bagels dark brown? I don't know, okay? <laughs> but everything now is dual. Fast, fused, deep, dual, open. One of us can now talk to all of us, and we can hear each other whisper. We can hear each other whisper. I tell the story of a professional golfer Justin Thomas was in a tournament in Shanghai. He had a five-foot putt. He missed it. He cursed to himself with a homophobic slur. Only one could hear it was him and the super-sensitive microphone on the edge of the green. In 48 hours, he lost his clothing contract with Polo. <laughs> we can hear each other whisper now. Fast, fused, deep, dual, open, and asymmetric. The world is incredibly asymmetric. Look at the war, war between Israel and Hezbollah now. Why are they in a standoff? Because Hezbollah has the same precision rockets now that Israel has. So because of that, Israel knows if it uses its precision rockets on Beirut airport, Hezbollah will use its precision rockets on Tel Aviv airport. Small and smaller units can now get super empowered. So today we have super powers and super empowered individuals and small groups. The world's gotten incredibly asymmetric. And lastly, uh, it's gotten fragile. Because we have connected every node and we've greased the connections between the nodes and then we took out the buffers. And now instability in one node, say uh, Wuhan, China, gets transmitted to the whole system overnight. The only way to govern a fast, fused, deep, dual, open, asymmetric and fragile world is no longer on a left-right grid. It can only be done through complex adaptive coalitions. I just close by giving you an analogy from computing. Basically, classical computing is built on zeros and ones, zeros and ones. It's like flipping a coin, heads or tails, zero and one. When you do it a billion times on a transistor, you get compute and storage. We're moving into the age of quantum computing. Quantum computing is like spinning a quarter. You can be zero and one at the same time. You can be heads and tails at the same time. Just as computing is going from binary to quantum, so our politics must go from binary politics to quantum politics. 
where you have to be public and private, together, separately, apart, and separate, and then integrated. You have to be zero and one at the same time. We are in that transition. Welcome to our Promethean moment. I call it the age of acceleration, amplification, and democratization. Never have more people had tools that amplify their power at a steadily accelerating rate and are being democratized with a small d shared with everyone on the planet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think after this uh, brilliant introduction, maybe a few questions, uh, please, Mr. Jumar. Uh, you, 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 a, a lot of discussions about technology going on in this not only flattish world, but uh, even more democratic, deep, integrated, fusioned. Um, we, we, we had a, a common friend that both of us had the pleasure to meet, uh, Mr. Gordon Moore. And uh, I, I remember when I was introduced to him, and I think uh, your wife Anne was with me, in a, in a party where our also common friend Peter Salomon got married in San Francisco, 2008. For me, was meeting. For those who don't know, Mr. Gordon Moore was the founder of uh, Intel, the creator of the Moore Law, and the inventor of the ship or the modern ship. Um, he was an engineer and mathematician and uh, became a very wealthy guy, um, but became a quite reflexive personality. And for me, it was like uh, meeting a Greek god in person. And then we had two hours talking and during that night. And uh, I asked all the questions about uh, Moore Law and the creation of the ship and so on. And Gordon uh, patiently explained me the, the whole thing or his version of the whole thing. But at the end, uh, we finished the conversation and we were standing up and, uh, and Gordon looked at me and said, Andrea, just let me remember you one thing. Uh, I created the ship with a pencil and a blank sheet of paper. <laughs> and uh, we talk a lot about artificial intelligence and the consequence of that. Now that we all know that Gordon invented the ship with a pencil and a blank sheet of paper, what do you think uh, AI or how AI is part of the discussions here can transform our world or the way that we live? Not from a technological sure. point of view, but uh, more of uh, from a humanitarian point of view or from a humanist point of view, uh, what will be the consequence for us? Well, I'd say a couple things, um, uh, Andre. Um, the, the net effect of these two super cycles is that um, what makes our Promethean moment so different from all the others is that we are becoming godlike. Uh, in a way no a member of our species has ever done before. We are becoming godlike in cognition, in connectivity, and in climate. We're becoming godlike in cognition in that we humans have now developed an artificial brain greater than what God endowed us with, greater than we evolved with. No member of our species has ever done that before. We humans have developed technologies of connectivity that enable us to hear each other whisper. No member of our species have ever done that. That is godlike. And we humans, we are the first generation of our species that have actually driven us from one climate era to, the, to another. We are now in the middle of driving ourselves from the Holocene, which existed for 11,500 years, and was the ideal climate era to produce civilization because it gave us four distinct seasons. So people could, prevent, could plant agriculture, create cities and civilization. We are driving ourselves from the only climate era we know could sustain civilization into a new climate era, the Anthropocene, the man-woman-driven era. 
we have become godlike. Just one problem. We're doing it too often without the Ten Commandments. We can part the Red Sea now, but we don't have the Ten Commandments. So values now, values, particularly the first value you learn in every faith has their version of it, the golden rule, do unto others as you wish them to do unto you. Because we now live in a world where more individuals can do unto others farther, faster, deeper, cheaper than ever before. So one of my rules about this era, Andre, is that the more we become godlike, the more Sunday school matters more than ever. The more good values matter more than ever because the power of one now to disrupt all of us is, is enormous. I just came from Silicon Valley before I came here, um, meeting at, uh, with a, um, one of the AI leaders at Google. He did a little test for me. I came into his office. He had a very technical scientific article on his computer screen. He took up his phone. He just pointed it at the computer screen, just like this, and said, Gemini, that's their AI bot. What am I reading? In a second, it told him the exact nature of the technical article he was reading. Then in, he said, please summarize the five most important points of this article. In another second, it summarized the five most important points of the article. Then he took out a notepad and scribbled three stick figures, pointed at that and said, Gemini, what movie does this remind you of? He said, oh, The Matrix. The first rule of this Promethean moment is everything happens faster than you think, both the climate change and the technology. AI is coming so fast, so far, and so deep, and it will literally change everything which is why I'm so glad I'm 70 and I'm at the end of my career because <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to change anything, okay? Uh, but um, it will change how we learn, how we teach, how we do business, um, uh, how we fight wars. You can see that already. And um, uh, all I can tell you is whatever business you're in, whatever NGO you're running, whatever university you are leading, you cannot move fast enough to understand how this works and how to get the benefits of it. Now, I happen to think that, as with all previous technologies, it will be disruptive and people will lose jobs, but it will be hopefully net positive. Hopefully. It will be disrupted. Remember, if horses could have voted, we never would have had cars. Okay? So, um, same with uh, the printing press and the Industrial Revolution. This, though, the upside, the, 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 the downside of it is that not sure if I'd like to be just an ordinary lawyer in the age of AI. Because if Gemini can just look at a computer screen like that, it can write your basic contract much faster and better and efficiently and cheaper than any lawyer in your firm, okay? So for a whole class of people, average is gonna be over, particularly white collar jobs. If you're just an average accountant, an average lawyer, um, uh, AI will blow you out of the water. But AI is also av making average over for a whole different group of people. You see, if you are an illiterate Brazilian farmer, in the Pantanal, you never had access to average. You barely had access to below average healthcare, education, agricultural advice. With AI now, there's a bot that that Brazilian farmer, illiterate, will be able to go to, and in not his own Portuguese language, in his own regional dialect, will be able to ask that bot 
how much water, which seeds, which hour of the day, that farmer, for the first time, not only will have access to average, it will have, he or she will have access to world class. So average is over for the poor and underclasses in ways that are totally exciting. Now, how all of this is going to net out, I have no idea. But all I can tell you is we are in the middle of a Promethean moment. So fasten your seat belts, put your seat backs and tray tables into a fixed, <laughs> upright position, OK? And learn everything you can, Andre, about AI and how to get the best of it and cushion the worst. Absolutely. Fantastic, Tom. Uh, Tom, this year is uh, 24, is uh, 20 years uh, from when you wrote uh, The World is Flat. And uh, uh, you launched the book in 2005, uh, wrote that in 2004, I presume. Yeah. Uh, so 20 years after that, and uh, after you had uh, so many experience, how flat is the world today for you? <laughs> I get that question a lot. In fact, the Financial Times gives out a book award, the best business book of the year award. And I was blessed. I got the first one in 2005 for The World is Flat. And uh, two months ago, they wrote me on the 20th anniversary of the book award. Now they, all, they wrote all 20 winners and said, you know, what would you change about your book now 20 years later? Um, and uh, uh, what other books should have won? And, you know, what new things are you thinking? And, and and the part of what I would change, I, I said, I would change nothing, and all my critics were wrong. Um, <laughs> because when the book came out, there's now a whole library of books saying the world is not flat, it's lumpy, crumpy, spiky, lumpy, curvy, whatever. <laughs> Get over it. The world is flat, the way I meant it. More people in more places can compete, connect, and collaborate on more things in more ways on more days for less money than ever before. Guess what? Girls just want to have fun. <laughs> People want to connect. The world is flat. Get over it. Um, and it's only going to get flatter in that way. And the question is, are you building a society, companies and countries, that can take advantage of that? That ability to compete, connect, and collaborate on more things in more ways on more days with more people for less money than ever before. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm actually, you know, net, again, positive about that. And yesterday, um, Andre got me together with a, a group of, of colleagues of his, and it was amazing. Everyone was half Ecuadorian, half Portuguese, lived in America, worked in Brazil. I could, if I did a Venn diagram of all the multiple identities of people in that room, it was 20 people with like 800 different identities, you know. <laughs> and um, that is a complex adaptive coalition, you know, and that is, that is the future. But I, Andre, I want to ask you a question. I've been talking too much. You've heard me talk now for two days. How do you see these trends here in Portugal and Brazil playing out? Well, I'm, I'm supposed to interview you, Tom. Well, yeah. Uh, not the, the, I need a drink of water. The, not, so. not, <laughs> not the other way around. I'll read my, uh, I'll read my contract again with Sidney, <laughs> Minister Jumar. But anyway, uh, uh, as you said, and uh, I totally agree, the world is uh, not only flat, but it's flatter than any other moment in life. <laughs> so uh, any kind of gap technological, political, any kind of scientific knowledge, I think these gaps are closing, not only to US or Brazil, but uh, to US, to Democratic Republic of Congo. And uh, I'm, a, I'm an optimist, and uh, uh, I, I'm a humanist, and I believe uh, uh, the Renaissance teaches us the power of the human-centric world. and. Uh, I do see the evolution of uh, all of you described here, this privileged moment, even though the change scares us, and uh, you are right about all of us, we need to learn different ways of doing things. But honestly, like any other technology or, or transformational technology, 
that we went through uh, from the last 300 years, people were scared about fire, were scared about agriculture, were scared about the press, uh, were scared about uh, airplanes, were scared about computers, about TV, about the radio. So I, I think um, these new uh, technologies make us scared because they bring transformation. They change the world and life as we know. But honestly, and certainly, in your example about uh, the isolated farmer at the Pantanal, it's a very good one, providing access to millions or billions of people of cutting-edge technology in a priceless way, basically, I think it will be a huge and immensely positive transformation uh, for, for the planet. Of course, we need to understand, and your knowledge about Boeing and uh, the aviation regulators, it's something that uh, we have many regulators here, judges, ministers, and different uh, agency uh, regulators. It's a reflection for us about how to regulate, because the world still needs to yep, be regulated. Absolutely. But it's so much transformation, so fast, so deep, that it's a, it's a good exercise for us about how to do that in an effective way where we can extract the benefits and avoid uh, uh, the, bad, uh, uh, the bad consequence of that. But uh, on overall basis, I think this will be a very positive transformation, especially for human beings. So uh, no matter if you are in Portugal, in Brazil, and especially if you are in the, the Met, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, I think you'll be impacted in a very positive way. Uh, just as a logistics, Minister Juma, how much time we have more? Uh, yeah, the two, two more questions. We have a, 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 an audience a, a question, Tom, uh, related to in this transformational world where AI can provide us with uh, all the knowledge available, who will be the, the opinion makers? Who will be our, our uh, gurus on a positive way? Uh, what kind of humans will, be, will lead our opinions? And uh, I expect that the answer should be people like in this panel, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, it's uh, a little early to tell, um, but I... I I have a chapter in my book, maybe I'll refer to, uh, use this to answer, Andrea. It's about why I write. Why, why do I write? Because if you want to be a columnist, the first question you have to ask is, why do you write? And I, I write for several reasons. The, the first reason I write is I write to learn. Um, uh, you know, I, I, all my books, they just start out with a kernel of an idea. The world is flat. It's like a big block of marble. And then I chip away and I interview Andre and I interview the next person, interview the minister, and I, and I chip away some more and I see a knuckle and an elbow and an eye and an ear and I chip away some more. So for me, uh, writing, the first and most enjoyable thing about it is I write to discover, I write to learn. And I urge anyone who wants to be a writer to, to want to have that aspiration. Uh, the second reason I write is I write to teach. Um, because uh, this is my form of idealism. Because I believe, to your question, Andre, we live in an incredibly complex age. And because we live in an age of such complexity, I live by the motto of Dr. Marie Curie. Now is the time to understand more so we may fear less. Now is the time to understand more so we may fear less. I can't speak about Portugal or Brazil, but I can tell you that in America, it is now a business, an industry, a big industry, to make people stupid and angry, okay? Um, to make them understand less and be afraid more. And the one reason I write is to make people understand more and be afraid less, because you cannot sustain a democracy without that. So that's the second reason I write. The third reason I write is to bend. Uh, Martin Luther King famously said that the arc of the moral universe bends toward justice, but it doesn't bend by itself. And I want to be in there bending the arc of the moral universe in what I think is the most equitable, fair, and productive way. That's the third reason I write. Actually, the last reason I write 
is because I need the eggs. You may remember the scene in Woody Allen's Annie Hall at the end where this guy goes to his doctor and says, his psychiatrist says, doctor, doctor, I have a terrible problem. My brother thinks he's a chicken. <laughs> and the doctor says, well, just tell him he's not a chicken. Guy says, I can't, I need the eggs. <laughs> so, um, so there is something irrational about what I do. But I will tell you, there are days I wake up at two in the morning and a column writes itself in my head. And what I do when that happens is I get out of bed and I put it down to my computer. I wait till my editors wake up at 8.30, I call them, I got this column, they like it. They get a copy editor and a fact checker. And by two in the afternoon, it's shared with 11 million people all over the world on NewYorkTimes.com. Friends, that is the most fun you can have legally that I know of, okay? <laughs> so those are the reasons that I, I write. It's for all of, those, all of those purposes. Clearly. Well, I think, uh, Tom, to conclude our, our chat here, maybe a more uh, specific question about the world that we are today. And uh, we have elections in the U.S. Uh, in a few months. And the uh, uh, U.S. is the most sophisticated democracy in the world. And uh, surprisingly, uh, we have two candidates that uh, are probably, for different reasons, uh, are not the ideal pattern of uh, what a sophisticated democracy like U.S. could produce. On the other hand, even though that we are immensely connected globally, you have more and more a more divisive world on the two blocks, one led by China, one led by U.S. How you see the geopolitics of the moment that we are today under these two topics? Well, there's a couple of questions there. One's sort of internal yeah. American politics, one's global, Andre, on, on, in a, terms of American politics right now. I've just described to you an incredibly complex transition we're going through as a civilization. And America is very likely, very possibly going to reelect Donald Trump as president. What could go wrong? Okay. Um, uh, so um, that uh, very much concerns me, um, uh, but it is a live possibility. I won't make any predictions because I, I don't know. Um, but one of my rules as a journalist is that whenever you see elephants flying, whenever you see elephants flying, don't make fun of it, take notes. Okay. And Donald Trump now leading Joe Biden in the polls, after everything that's happened, after everything he's done, that's a flying elephant. And, um, and you shouldn't make fun of it, dispute it, you should try to understand it. Right now I can't fully understand it, um, but it is a very real possibility, is, is what I would say. Now, your, the second part of the question was it's about... Related to divisive war, yeah. China, U.S. So, yeah, you know, what I would say to that is that the calendar today reads 2024. But the date is actually 1989. We are, in 1989, we defined the rules and norms of the post-Cold War world. And that project was very much dominated by uh, uh, America, a, a liberal America that um, made a million mistakes and, and did a lot of stupid things, but nevertheless basically tried to promote a more consensual political world, a world of more consensual democratic politics, and one uh, of more trade and integration. We are now defining the post-Cold post War world. If you were to ask me what was going on in the world on October 6th, on October 6th, the day before the Hamas invasion of Israel, what I would tell you is on October 6th, two big things were happening. Ukraine was trying to join the West, and Israel was trying to join the East, normalizing with Saudi Arabia. That's what was going on. Ukraine, a country of 40 million people, biggest agricultural sector in Europe, one of the biggest tech sectors in Europe, now the biggest land army in Europe. If Ukraine is able to join the European Union, you will have a Europe almost entirely whole and free except for the Western Balkans. It would be the biggest expansion of an inclusive Europe 
since East Germany joined West Germany. East Germany, East Germany. Who was the KGB colonel in East Germany? Vladimir. God named Vladimir Putin. So Putin understood very much what it means for a Europe whole and free if Ukraine, a Slavic Ukraine, becomes a successful EU member or partner compared to a Slavic kleptocratic Russia. And he moved to stop it. If Israel were able to normalize with Saudi Arabia on terms stipulated by Saudi Arabia, that it moved to a pathway of two states for two people, it would be the biggest progress of an inclusive Middle East since Camp David. And Iran and Hamas understood the meaning of that, that they would be isolated, and they moved to stop it. So we're now in the middle of a titanic struggle between the world of inclusion and the world of resistance. It's 1989 all over again, only we're talking about the post-post-Cold War world. My own feeling is that America is hugely important to this world, but America when we're at our best, not when we're at our worst. And um, how this moment will come out, I have no idea, um, but I should maybe conclude by telling you, I said to you that I would talk about what's the biggest thing that happened in my career, what's the biggest adaptation, we've just talked about that. What do I believe is the best thing that happened in my 45 years of being a journalist? This shocks Americans when I tell them. I think the most important thing that happened in my 45 years as an American journalist was the creation of the European Union. That in my lifetime, a continent known for religious and tribal and ethnic wars from time immemorial created the biggest center of free markets, free people, human rights, and the rule of law. You created another United States of your own kind, a United States of Europe, not as fully integrated as ours, but pretty damn impressive. I am lucky, privileged to be part of the generation that gives to live in a world of two United States, not just one. The world would be so different if the EU did not exist as it does today. Now Americans will do anything, absolutely anything, for the European Union except read about it, okay? So um, uh, it's, it's very hard to explain to them uh, the importance of this institution. But if you haven't figured it out by now, you will understand why I am so appreciative of the EU. It is the world's biggest man-made, complex, adaptive, Coalition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom Friedman. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Thank you very much.